So was that in a way, I mean, writing Rocky Horror, was that a, uh, some sort of way of coming I, out? I think there's certainly something cathartic about, about doing that, yeah, I, I guess so. But once again, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't knowingly, it was just releasing kind of ideas and thoughts and emotions. The process of writing, I mean, you said you went home, you wrote off a couple, another couple of songs. I mean, how hard is it for you to sit and create? Well, strangely, when the, when the, uh, when the clock's on, it's, it's kind of easier. Uh, Touch a Touch a Touch Me was the song I wrote for Rocky Horror, and I wrote that, I probably wrote that in about an hour and a half. I was watching the rehearsals when we had Julie Covington playing Janet, and she finished the scene. I thought she should certainly have a song for herself, and I, I just went home, and I think probably by eight o'clock I'd, I'd, I'd written the song and took it in the next day. And it's because when you're under pressure, you, you, be, you do become more focused, don't you? I suppose why I was wondering, I mean, for someone who grew up bearing part of yourself inside you, because... Living in my head. Yeah, living in your head. Mm. Yet you could still be the extrovert and... Yeah, well, that's the person you put out there, isn't it? Because you don't want, you don't want to be compromised. And, um, and especially amongst the bullies, you don't want to be... Um, um, bullied, you so say you, you put on this kind of, you, you build this kind of character and it becomes very much you, but there's that secret you inside. That's what I always feared, that I didn't want, I didn't want to be a mad person and I, I, I wanted to be a completely open and candid human being and be myself and, and be free and in, in so doing free myself and free other people. If I go into a shop now and I say, and they've got a nice pair of high heels, I say, have you got those in a 41? And there's a little kind of moment and they go, and uh, can I try those on? That little kind of moment, because I'm going to a really great party tonight. And it's, you know, I've got this really fantastic frock. And within seconds, everyone's rushing around trying, finding other shoes for you. Because you've made everything, everybody relax. You know, you know what I mean? It's a different kind of journey. We're going to have some fun now. And, uh, and everybody relaxes around you. And I like that. <laughs> Have we changed? Has it, is it, have attitudes changed? Yeah, and people are much more uh, people are much more easygoing these days. We have to get back to Hamilton because we are in Hamilton, and there's been a lot of controversy about the the statue, and about the the riffraff poster around town. I've got a and few letters from the editor here, but, actually. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but most of the finger wagging comes from people who haven't seen the show, and actually they they say they say we, as if they've been elected as the spokesperson of Hamiltonians. Apparently, Rocky is going to attract homosexuals to the city. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> you should be so lucky. <laughs> I think here's the, here's the exact quote, Richard. Do we want to become another homosexual mecca rather than a beautiful, productive, peaceful and family orientated yeah. city? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what an idiocy. I mean, this is infantile, isn't it? There's one guy, there's one guy who wrote a letter to the papers. So I've looked up the word riffraff in my junior dictionary. And, and, you know, the derivations of Riff Raffa, you know, low people, Demi Monde, you know, blah, 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 blah. He wasn't satisfied with that. He said, I went out to the library and looked up in five other dictionaries <laughs> and still got the same result. Okay? <laughs> it's a literary and theatrical device to give a character a name which tells us about the character. In Jacobean comedy, we have the name Face in The Alchemist. Face tells you everything about this person, duplicity. Um, we have ladies, we have Sneerwell and Teasel and names like this. It, it, they tell us something about the character and they allow us to enjoy the character on a deeper level. Um, Uriah Heap, what a wonderful name that is. <laughs> you know, it's a made up name by Dickens, but it, you know, you think, immediately you think of a, a, a urine sodden dung heap, don't you? <laughs> Uriah Heap. You know, of course. As, a, as for, for attracting uh, transvestites and transsexuals and transgendered people and gay people to Hamilton on the premise that there is this theme inside the piece is nonsense. If I'd have taken the second um, major story in the Bible, which is Cain slaughtering his brother Abel, and written that as a musical and played the role of Cain, <laughs> and you'd build a statue of me in the role of Cain, by the same premise, it's going to attract murderers to the city, isn't it? <laughs> and murderers who kill their brothers. You know, they're all going to flock in. What a load of nonsense. <laughs> what was it like growing up here? Um, growing up in Hamilton was, uh, it was difficult for me because I was a wee bodgy and, uh, and, a, and an air-do-well, a, a juvenile delinquent. And, uh, I, you know, for a little while it was, it was very dodgy. I got into a lot of trouble and, 
and a friend of mine and, and two of us got into a bit of trouble. And then I kind of grew up slightly. And in the 19, 1962, 1963, Hamilton was exceptionally healthy. The high street was exceptionally healthy. Everybody my age was suddenly starting to make money. Um, uh, labor was still intensive. Uh, there was a lot of jobs around, there were paddle beaters and workshops all around. There was a lot of, lot of work. I was earning 20 pounds a week in 1964. That was a lot of money uh, for a 22-year-old boy. And, uh, and, and the high street was buzzing. We were all full of the joys of spring. We were surfing at Raglan, and we were, we were at the coffee shops every night. And it was, it was, pretty, it was pretty hot, Hamilton in 64. But you'd left school very early. I left school at 15, yeah. To do what? Well, I was sent off to uh, Putaru, to that, uh, to that farm, uh, to uh, the error of my ways. And uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Hodderton, it was called, and I was supposed to become a farmer. Um, that wasn't going to work. Was um, it ever going to work? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, did, I did my best. I, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I refused to be beaten. I was there, I was as a kind of like, I was probably about just under eight stone. And, uh, and they'd, they'd have a, a big tractor with a, with a huge crank on the front of it, and they'd, they'd, they'd go and crank it up, you know, the big guys. And I, and I, but I wouldn't be beaten. I would turn the engine over. There was no way they were going to stop me doing that. I refused to be belittled and marginalized by, by the, the big guys. <laughs> so you worked out that farming wasn't going to be for you? No. I came to Hamilton to, to uh, go into a, a barber shop. Uh, right where the statue is now, um, Pat Osborne took me on as his apprentice, and uh, and I worked for him for four and a half, five years, and um, cut hair, and he paid me exceptionally well. I mean, I have to say, twenty pounds a week in '64 doesn't sound much now, but it was a lot of money, thousand pounds a year. '64. Uh, I got to England in 1964, and the and the, the, the general wage was about ten pounds a week, so I'd earning twice of that, and the New Zealand pound was worth exactly the same as the British pound in those days. So that was a lot of day. So when you got to England, I mean, what was the plan? What... No, I was lost at the, the time. I, I stayed with my grandparents for about six months, perhaps a little less, and then I took myself up to London, and I met some of the people I'd been on the boat with, and we saw an advert for somebody for riding, horse riding for, for movies, and another chap and I went along to audition. We went out to a, a paddock on a wet Wednesday afternoon and rode a, a bareback, a great fat mare, around the paddock, and if you could manage to stay on, you know, you got the gig. I rode in three movies in 65, riding horses, and that was my entrance, uh, introduction to the world of showbiz. Weird intro, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> At that stage, you thought your life was going to be acting. You were determined I knew I wanted, to make I knew that I wanted to be in show business. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then I worked backstage in the theatres. I worked every, every job in the theatre. I never wanted to leave the theatre. What was it about it that you liked so much? I don't know, just the magic. I remember the first time I was ever on a stage, I was, I was given the job, me and another girl, we were at drama school, and we were given the job of cleaning the stage before the, the production took place, and the two of us looked at each other while we were sweeping the stage, and we went, isn't it great? <laughs> <laughs> we're on the stage, sweeping it, but we're still on it. <laughs> it's, there's, there's, there's just something magical. And one of the nicest things about, uh, I've just been doing Chitty Chitty Bang Bang in, in Singapore, playing the child catcher, which is a great role, for, um, a spooky role. And one of the great things about that is the family has come with children, and to, to take a child of seven or eight, the curtain goes up, the lights go down, the curtain goes up, and take a child on a, on a, on a, a magical journey uh, is, is just so wonderful. And, and to think that maybe you know, in, in the future that they may get into the theatre themselves because that was the moment that we, we gave them some, such a, a wonderful kind of thrill. What are you like with your own children? Um, <laughs> I don't know. They put up with me severely. 